Well, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, this is Michael Rourke, and the topic of the uh, webinar this afternoon, or this morning, it's afternoon for me, step-by-step uh, -step snow load design. Uh, and the objective is to present a 17-step approach to snow load design using ASCE 710. Um, some of you may already know that ASCE 716 has become available. And at the end of this presentation, there's three or four slides <clears throat> related to the changes between ASCE 710 and ASCE 716. Uh, this webinar in particular is going to con uh, concentrate on <clears throat> the correct application of the provisions, uh, the what and the how. Uh, there, as needed, the theory, that is the why, will be briefly discussed. And the roof geometries that we're going to consider are those that are envisioned by ASCE 7, uh, not any um, more oddball, uh, unusual provision or roof geometries, which um, sometimes are, well, are actually becoming somewhat more common. Um, so with that, let's look at the outline. There, as I mentioned, there are 17 steps altogether. The first um, six or seven uh, are for essentially a uniform load case over the whole roof. Um, and there's a bunch of, uh, well, there's six or seven steps to, to figure out what that is. Um, and then the rest will be spent primarily talking about drifts. Uh, drifts are particularly important for snow because the my uh, I've investigated in my uh, career uh, about five dozen uh, snow-related uh, structural collapses. Seventy-five percent of them are drift-related. And so the, uh, although we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about uniform loads, it's much more frequent that the problem is a drift load of one kind or another. Uh, the, and then finally, we're going to present an example and then a couple of slides on what is new in ASCE 716. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the balanced roof load, and that's P sub S. Um, and it's a function of a number of parameters. Uh, it is a function of the exposure due to wind. It's a function of the thermal characteristics of the roof, the importance of the structure itself, the roof slope, um, and the ground snow load, and then eventually all of those things need to be combined. And so we're going to, this step one has six sub-steps. Uh, we're going to address each of those in turn. And so the first one is going to be the exposure of the roof. And the theory behind this is if there is a lot of wind, that wind will take the snow off the roof, the, the, the snow will be blown off the roof, and so terrains that are particularly windy uh, and result in a high roof level wind, uh, those terrains would have then that more snow is off the roof, and so the C sub E factor would be lower. Uh, and so those high wind terrains are ones that have low surface roughness. We've stolen or utilized. Uh, liberated from the wind folks, it's some classific a classification system. And so going from a high wind terrain to a low wind terrain, we would have a seashore environment, D, um, which has uh, very little surface roughness, a flat country, which has a little bit more surface roughness, and eventually to urban and suburban, which have a fair amount of surface roughness. Uh, a beach is a great place to fly a kite because it is uh, there's so little surface roughness that it's inherently windier than other um, terrains. Similarly, uh, in terms of the theory, depending on what the um, exposure of the roof is to the wind that's there, it could be fully exposed, it could be partially exposed, or it could be sheltered. Uh, the more exposure you have, the more likely the wind is going to reduce the snow from the roof. And so uh, we need to, the exposure factor is a function of 
not only the windiness of the area, but the location of the structure in that um, environment. 